Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his, pe- he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and called his name Jesus. Those of you who are guests, thank you for coming uh, this evening. My name is Jerry. I'm the senior pastor here at Covenant. We're glad to have you with us. And, and those of you who are part of our Covenant family or circle, some of you are coming from out of town and back in seeing family. And it's been a while. It's good to see uh, familiar faces. And what a great time of the year. Um, you know, we have been working down in our Advent season from uh, Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we went from 4 to 3. And then this uh, morning, we were in the first half of chapter 1, which apparently many of you didn't want to hear about the genealogy of Jesus, so you skipped. And uh, you came tonight instead. So I'm surprising you. I'm re-preaching this morning's message. So, uh, no, I'm not going to do that to you, okay? But uh, we, we, uh, we went through the genealogy of Jesus this morning. And Ben Harris, man, he had to read 40 some odd names. You know, uh, Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Jacob. And I mean, you know, after a while, you, your eyes just start crossing over. Uh, and, and now we finished out the second half of chapter 1. Uh, in this Advent season. You know what's interesting about this account? If this was the only account, <clears throat> excuse me, of the birth of Jesus, if the only account that we had was the one here in Matthew, uh, we would not know many of the details of Jesus' birth that are just taken for granted. But, you know, there would be no away in a manger on a silent night with shepherds, with their flocks abiding, and uh, Rudolph, well, no, Rudolph's not in there anyway. But, you know, there would be none of this stuff that we would know about if we only had Matthew chapter 1. In fact, if you, if you step back and you analyze the birth narrative here in, in Matthew chapter 1, the central character isn't Jesus at all. I mean, he's just mentioned kind of, you know, in, in, in sort of a secondhand birth. The central character is, is who? It's Joseph. Joseph is the guy with all the action going on. And, you know, if you combine this fact with, you know, that wonderful list of genealogical names and the point that we were making this morning about how Jesus is the climax and the completion of the, the history of Israel, especially her redemptive history and what God has been doing. There are, are some intriguing and neat gospel applications that I want to give you this evening over the next hour and a half. Um, no, I've only been given 10 minutes or so, so don't worry about it. Maybe 15, okay, 30, but we'll get there. No, all right, let me give you that first one. You know, the, the neat thing about this story is that God consistently uses obscure but obedient people who walk with him. It's one of the things we pull out of this story when you think about Joseph. I mean, think about Joseph for a minute. What do we really know about him? Uh, We don't know how old he is. We don't know how tall he is. We don't know what he looks like. We don't know whether he can carry a tune. All we really know about him in the scriptures is that he was a carpenter, um, that he really lived in Nazareth, that he was, his dad was Jacob. We know that because of the genealogy a few verses before, right? Um, uh, we we kind of surmise that he died before uh, Jesus' ministry began because he's not mentioned anywhere, you know, during the Gospels. Uh, he drops off. He, this is it. We're done. After Matthew 2, you know, he goes to Egypt, comes back from Egypt with Jesus. They settle him. That's it. We're done with Joseph. He, he walks off the pages. We don't know much about him. He's an obscure guy. 
from, from our perspective, there is really nothing to commend this guy being used by God. He is a carpenter. He is a blue collar guy in a little town, in a little village really, in the middle of nowhere on the backside of the Roman Empire. Nothing to commend him to God. Or was there something that made Joseph incredibly usable? even though he was obscure. I would contend that there is because we know something about Joseph that's vitally important. We know something about Joseph's character and his heart from this account. Verse 8, 19 says, her husband, Joseph, he hears that Mary is pregnant and he knows he's not the cause of this. And from all that he can tell, she has been unfaithful. Um, and so her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. What do we know about his character here? We know that he was conflicted, but ultimately his allegiance was to the word of God and obeying God even more than to Mary. You know, the account says he pondered, he waited, he thought about it. And then the angel came and said, hold it, stop what you're thinking about doing. And the indication here is that, you know, he's, there's a struggle here, but he's decided I'm going to obey God and God's word and God's law, God's word required that a woman who had become pregnant out of wedlock, and in this case, from all intents, you know, from appearances, she had been unfaithful. There was infidelity there. The law actually considered her an adulteress and the penalty for this adultery was death by stoning. And Joseph, he says, what do I do? He loves Mary. From what we can see, the conflict is probably because of his love, but he loves God. And he decides, I must obey God. That tells you a lot about Joseph. And then also, it tells you a lot about him and the fact that he decides he's not gonna insist on his justice that he's due. He decided, I'm going to get this taken care of quietly. I don't want Mary to be punished for this. Let's, let's take care of this situation in as quiet a manner as possible so that she is protected and not put to shame. And so you see the grace and the mercy that is in this man. He doesn't require justice, which was technically his due. Instead, he extends grace and mercy when he could have insisted on the penalty of the law. So it tells us a lot about him that there was this balance of grace and mercy with this allegiance to truth and to God. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? When religious leaders would bring people to him, they would bring women to him, for example, who were caught in adultery, and Jesus dealt with them so graciously and mercifully. They would bring different people caught in different scandalous situations, and Jesus' response to them sounds a whole lot like Joseph with Mary. We know a lot about his character. We can see some things about his character and his heart. We know something about Joseph's allegiance to God and how important this allegiance is to God's plan. I mean, a lot hinges on this obscure guy being obedient to God. A, a, a gentleman this morning after the service asked me a, a very important question when we got to the end of the sermon and message and whatnot on the genealogies. He said, Jerry, how could Jesus be the Messiah of Israel, the king, the prophesied king, the, the son of David who's going to sit on the throne, when he did not have, Joseph was not technically his father. You know, it needed to be a, somebody who was, you know, born in that family tree to sit on that throne, according to the prophecies. See, this is one of the arguments that skeptics use against Jesus being the Messiah. And not that this man was a skeptic, he was, but he was voicing an argument that has been raised and speaking with, uh, Jewish rabbis, for example, when I've had conversation with them and they argue against the Messiahship of Jesus, they bring this up. Well, wait a second. If he's born of a virgin, he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah must be born of a person 
in the family line of David. And what they're missing is Joseph's allegiance to God and how important it is to this very idea. You see, he receives his instructions not to divorce and he obeys these instructions and instead he becomes the child's father. He exercises authority over this baby and he gives them the name Jesus in obedience to the commands that he's given. But by exercising authority and saying, this is my child, his name is Jesus. What Joseph is doing in that day and age is he is adopting him into his family tree. Jesus is grafted into the royal line of David. And what, what beauty is here that we see that Joseph, by obeying God and naming him and raising him and brings him into the royal family line of David. And what beautiful foreshadowing, because this is exactly what Jesus has accomplished for us. He's adopted into this human family and as humanity's representative, he dies on the cross and he pays the penalty of our sins because he is the one who will, and he alone, this passage says, who will pay for the sins of his people. Through him alone comes forgiveness, this passage tells us. And through that forgiveness, he who is engrafted into a human family makes it possible for us to be adopted into the family of God. A beautiful synchronicity here. And once we're adopted into God's family, the great thing is our potential for being used by God to affect our kingdom or our community, to affect God's kingdom, to, to see him work in our life and to touch people with the love of Christ and with the good news of Jesus Christ. It does not depend upon our prominence in society because God consistently uses People who are not prominent, people who are obscure, who from a human perspective don't have anything to commend themselves. Our usability by God is not based upon our prominence by human standards. Our usability is based on us being his children who listen to his voice like Joseph. It's based on us being his children who delight in obeying him like Joseph. The beautiful application that God consistently uses obscure people, people that from a worldly perspective are not prominent, people who look a lot of times like maybe you and me, but who delight in hearing God and obeying him. Another application, God fulfills his promises in this text, but he does it on a very different timetable than what our timetable is, isn't it? I mean, verse 23, 22 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's, he's referring to a prophecy that was made more than 700 years before. Now, now do that math. In other words, people had been waiting for 700 years. I mean, our nation isn't that. I mean, our nation's only, what, 200 and something years old? 700 years. They had been waiting for this promise to come true. And in actuality, if we combine it with the genealogies, that the verses before it, the promises made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, they had been waiting for 2,000 years for the promises of God to come true. I wonder this evening how many of us here are waiting on God for something. You're waiting on him to do something for you. You're, you're waiting on God to heal the hurt that's in your heart. You're waiting on God to answer that repeated prayer that you have for an issue. You're waiting on God to bring salvation to a loved one. You're waiting on God to give you that better job. You're waiting on God to put you in that relationship with that perfect girl or that perfect guy who's gonna make all of your problems go away. The birds sing brighter, light, nicer and louder and the sun shine brighter, right? You're waiting on God 
and you're certain he's going to give you what you're waiting for. I wonder how many of us are waiting on God this evening. Now listen, if you're waiting on God for something that is only grounded in uh, you know, your own desires or your imagination or on you know, misinterpretations of Scripture or verses that are strung together, you know, oh, God gives me the desires of my heart. It says that in the Bible, and that gum and I desire a 34-foot CV with dual outboard motors. <laughs> Did you take care of that for me, Catherine, for Christmas? <laughs> it's going to have a big red bow on the side of my house, right? Right, babe? I mean, if you're waiting on God, I mean, understand if, if you're waiting on God for things and your basis is is not grounded in the promises of God in Scripture on His character. Dream on. Dream on. But when you're waiting on God for something that is grounded in His Word, on His promises, take it to the bank. God fulfills His promises. That's the good news. The bad news is his clock and calendar ain't your clock and calendar. <laughs> That's the bad news. I mean, from God's perspective, how he fulfills his promises, 2,000 years is just a snap of time. And so if you're waiting on God and you're confident that what you're waiting for is in his will, be confident that you're going to find him answering and fulfilling his promises. It doesn't mean that he's unfaithful just because you're not getting the answer that you're waiting for in the time that you want it. Because God fulfills his promises every single time. But he does it at a different timetable, on a different timetable than ours. One final application. God redeems our story as he weaves his story of grace and redemption through history. You know, this passage that we read this evening, the story of Joseph, good man, obeys God, but he's a sinner. Mary's a sinner. There, the, the genealogy before it, oh my, oh my. You look at the list of men in the family line of Jesus, what a group of scoundrels. I mean, you've got adulterers, you've got murderers, you've got thieves, you've got blasphemers. You, I mean, you name it, man. You name, the you name the command and the abomination, and Jesus has got somebody in his family tree who was the poster child for that abomination or that sin. And then you look through that genealogy and you notice something else, something very, very rare. Something that you would normally not see in a Jewish genealogy. You know what you see? Women. Women listed. Five women are listed in the genealogy of Jesus. One of them is Mary, okay? But the other four women that are in this genealogy from a Jewish perspective... They all have scandal attached to them, okay? Um, they, they are all from outside the nation of Israel. They're Gentiles. They're unclean. And boy, are some of them unclean, all right? I mean, there's the story of Tamar. Now, Tamar, I can't tell you her story because of sensitive ears in this room this evening. <laughs> and I can't really tell you the story of Rahab. Some of you know that story, but again, we have sensitive ears here this evening. And I can't, you know, there's, then there's, there's one lady, he doesn't even tell you her name. He just says, she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now who that was, was Bathsheba, who apparently liked to take baths in inappropriate places. Okay? I mean, again, sensitive ears preclude me from telling you that story. I mean, the only story I can tell you about the women in this list is Ruth the Moabitess. And she comes from a country that God says is his chamber pot, which I also won't define because of sensitive ears. Right? I mean, 
these women, they have everything against them. And yet, every one of these women have a beautiful story of restoration and redemption, and they enter into the family line of Jesus, and they play critical roles where God demonstrates even back to the beginning of the story that the gospel is for everyone. It's not just for the people of Israel, it's for Gentiles, and it's especially not for people who have their act together. It's, who, it's for people who come from the wrong side of the tracks, from the wrong side of the world, from the wrong side of life, and no matter what kind of baggage you have, no matter what kind of uh, past history that is, you're carrying around, the gospel is for you. What an amazing message this is in this story of Jesus' history. And while God doesn't treat sin lightly, God is not paralyzed, folks, by our past sin. How often do we sideline ourselves in the work of God because of our past that we carry around with us when the gospel teaches us that through Christ our past has been pardoned, it's been put under the blood of Christ, and there is freedom, and there is restoration, and there is deliverance, there's victory. He brings victory through people who are huge sinners. Aren't you glad about that? Because I got news for you. I am a huge sinner. Wish I were not. But it's my story, and I can't get away from it. But that's not my only story. It's just part of the story. And the other part of the story is that the sin was borne by Jesus on the cross. And while, yes, I have to say I'm a huge sinner, I'm also hugely righteous because of Christ. And God, through people like you and me, who are huge sinners, brings incredible victories. This is the message of the gospel. There is more grace, folks in Jesus Christ, then there is sin in your heart. There is more grace in him than there is sin in you. And if you're here this evening and you're carrying around these types of burdens thinking, I'm a nothing, I can be nothing, I can be used by God in no way, I, I can't get free of my past, understand the story of Jesus and the story that we see here in Joseph says, no, that's not the good news. That's not the good news at all. For she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save, he will deliver his people from their sins. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you left the beauty and the glory and the grandeur of heaven. And you took on human flesh. You live the life with all of the pain and with all of the sorrows that we have to live. You, you walk as we walk, but in a different way in that you perfectly obeyed the law of God. You lived that life that we were to live so that you could take our place on the cross, represent us, and take our sins upon you, and pay that penalty so that we could one day stand before our Heavenly Father declared righteous. Lord, I, I ask you this evening, even here at Christmas Eve when we celebrate your birth, I know that there are those here tonight who they carry around burdens, they carry around chains, and they are enslaved in different ways. Sometimes they know it, sometimes they're ignorant of it. Would you open their eyes and open their hearts and their ears so that they can see the deliverance that can only come through you? Lord Jesus, you came to set men and women free. And when you set us free, we are free indeed. And so for the one who's enslaved this evening from their past 
or even because of things that are in their present Would you open their eyes so that they can lean into you and receive you and the grace and the power that can only come through you, Lord Jesus? Do this for their good, for the expansion of your kingdom and for the glory of your own name, I ask. Amen.